So welcome everyone to this evening's Doc Talk. Um, I'm Betsy Post here from Colon Town, and I'm here to just host this amazing, incredible talk, uh, the interview with an icon, Dr. Nancy Kemeny on the hepatic pump for colorectal cancer liver metastases. So it's just such an honor to have Dr. Kemeny with us this evening. Um, she, of course, is the pioneer of the hepatic pump and has treated so many patients over her many years um, at Sloan Kettering, including many, um, of course, from Colon Town. Um, her name is, of course, talked about every single day, all day long in Colon Town, um, as is the pump. Um, and Dr. Kemeny, we have an entire group um, called the HAI Pump People. This is the cover photo for that group. Uh, so we just are so excited to have you here this evening. We recognize your contributions, your work, your passion for patients, um, just everything that you've done throughout the years. It's just such a humbling experience to have you with us to talk about the pump. We have so many patients whose lives have been changed by your work. Um, these are just a few of them. I, I know that you know them all. Um, you've done such amazing things for so many of us, like I said, and I'm just so excited to have you here to talk about the pump. Um, also to record this so that those that can't be with us this evening, and then of course, as we onboard more and more uh, patients and families every single day, they'll be able to refer back to this. I can pin it right at the top of the group and everyone can hear um, your genius, your expertise on the pump. So again, thank you for being here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Betsy. And also thank you for all the work you do. It's a lot of work to help all these patients and I really appreciate it. And I also want to tell you that many times I get patients and they tell me the way they got to me is through coal and town. So it's interesting how much you influence all these patients. Okay. So um, right now, the Intera is the only pump that's available for implantable pump for HAI. For a little while, we were using the Medtronic, but it's really an inferior pump because we had to connect it to a catheter. That was the uh, catheter coming from the Codman and Intera people. The pump is the lithium, and its weight is five ounces, so what? it's not that heavy. And it contains a drug reservoir that is attached to a long tube connected to the hepatic artery. The drug flows through the tube and is directly going into the hepatic artery into the liver. Here's a picture of the inside of that pump, and you can see that there's two bolus needles but I mean, one bowl of speed, but one needle that goes into the actual reservoir so that if we're doing a flow scan or some other injection directly into the catheter, we use the bolus needle. <clears throat> but if we're refilling the pump directly, we use the um, regular needle. The pump doesn't run on a battery. Uh, it continues to power to be there. And I've had patients you use the pump even 10 years out from when we started. <clears throat> so why even think of regional therapy? Well, 15% of patients have liver meds at diagnosis. Another 60 develop liver meds during their follow-up. And as you can see, we, we have a number of colorectal patients a year in the United States. Now, this is what a liver med looks like. And you can see it's taking its blood supply from the hepatic artery there. They can't see that. Or can they? Oh, they can point. Yeah. This one? Yeah, here we have the hepatic artery giving the blood supply to this tumor. Now, what we did to make sure that it was coming from the hepatic artery is we injected a labeled FUDR. So it was labeled so we could see where it was going, either into the hepatic artery or the portal vein. And you can see much more got to the tumor through the hepatic artery. While if you look at the normal liver, the same amount got there from either the artery or the vein. So if you think that liver meds are perfused by the hepatic artery, if you think that some drugs are extracted by the liver, and then you have to think of the liver meds being the only site 
of metastatic disease, which is possible because they're coming up the portal vein into the liver. So if you could control the liver, you may be able to control the disease. So this is the picture showing you how the pump is placed under the abdominal wall. It's connected to the gastroduodenal artery. And here's the common hepatic, left and right hepatic. So you can see that we connect it up and it should then perfuse the whole liver. <clears throat> now we then have to do what's called a macro aggregated albumin scan. And what we do, why we do that, is we want to make sure that we're perfusing the liver and not outside the liver. So here's a case outside the liver. This is the liver, this is the stomach. So if you were to start the treatment on this patient without correcting this problem, they would develop terrible ulcer disease. So we have interventional radiologists who can tie up the vessel going to the stomach if something like this happens, and we can still use the pump. Now, one of the things that we learned very early when we were working with this pump is that it may hurt the liver, not really so much the liver as the bile ducts. And we thought if the bile ducts uh, are being inflamed, that possibly using Decadron would decrease that inflammation. So we did a randomized study. Can you know what I'm uh, <clears throat> yeah, we did a randomized study comparing FUDR plus Decadron, that's a steroid, to FUDR low. We were blinded as the physician and nurses to who was getting the Decadron, only the pharmacist knew. But you can see here that the people who were getting the Decadron had less bilirubin elevation and actually had a higher response and a higher median survival. Now, this was in 1992, when at that point, the response rate for colon cancer was about 15%. So this was very high. So because of that, a national group, the CALGD, took this idea and decided to do a randomized study of hepatic arterial infusion versus systemic, not allowing a crossover. <clears throat> at that time, the systemic chemo was part of the with the warrant. In this study, we did prove an increase in survival, an increase in response rate, and an increase in hepatic disease-free survival. So all these were highly significant. So we went on a memorial to test the idea of using the pump treatment. That particular study I just showed you. Let me go back to the study. Okay. This was with FUDR alone. So these were the results with just FUDR, no systemic chemotherapy. But we thought, since it was just using one drug, and as many of you know, that if you use a combination of drugs, you get a higher response rate. So we thought, why not use the pump with systemic therapy? So the pump therapy, as you know, is given day one, emptied on day 15 of each month, and the systemic was going to go in every time you touch the pump. So this was our first study, small study, 49 patients. But if you look at the patient who had no prior therapy, all of them responded, 100% response rate. We had never seen that before treating metastatic colon. And we had a 50-month median survival, and a number of them were able to get to resection. If you look at the previously treated patients, 85% had a response rate, meaning survival 35 months, which is very good for second line therapy. And this is what we call the waterfall curve. So each line here represents a patient and, and it represents the decrease in tumor that patient experienced. So when I started out of Memorial, the responses I was seeing were up here, oops, like just a few little responses in this area. This is more than a 75% reduction in the majority of patients. So to show you that, I'll show you what that looks like. So here's a patient with a lot of disease who is not resectable. There's no way they could take the tumor out because it was involving all the big vessels here. And this is her response. Now, 
It was still involving some of the vessels, but we argued, I argued with the surgeons to take her to a section. And we, we did, there was no tumor. And she went on to live, she's still alive. This started in 2019, uh, 02, when she's still alive. And here's another patient with massive disease. This patient in the old days would have been alive a few months It was such massive disease. And she went on to live five years after the scan. She never reoccurred in the liver, but she recurred in the lymph nodes. And here's a patient, this is a PET scan. All these black spots represent tumor. And here's the liver after the pump treatment. And you can see, you don't see any tumor here. Now, the PETs aren't perfect. You could still have tumor and not see it on the PET, but certainly you can see that it's a great response. So this man developed this problem that we call biliary sclerosis. So you can see the, the dilatation of his bile ducts. So we're not really hurting the liver, but we're hurting the bile ducts. And he developed an increase in his alkphos. But when we stopped treatment, his alkphos went down. It was 800, went down to 200. And since his bilirubin was never elevated, we never had to put a stent in him. And here he is 15 years later. He never had a liver resection. He just had the pump treatment. And he had the problem I described to you. So even though he, he developed the biliary problem, he went on, as you see, went away eventually. He went on to live for 15 years. Now, what about second line treatment? We have all these new drugs that have been approved by the FDA, but they've done very little for the response rate or the survival. When we add panitumumab or cetuximab, the EGFR receptor drug, we do increase the response rate, but again, the survival is not that good, second line. And here's what happens if we add, the, hello? If we add the pump of uh, second line. Um, this is our work here, these first two studies, and really doubling the survival. And this is the European studies. They use oxaloplatinum in the pump because they can't use FUGR because it has Freon in it, and they have a rule in Europe they can't use uh, Freon. They can't use the Freon pump, um, and they can't, and they don't have FUDR approved. However, the Netherlands has sort of, uh, we, who are now doing studies of the pump, now do have a pump they can use in Europe, and they did get approval for FUDR. So here's a lady's second line, so that she progressed on CPT. Oops or what's called the rena TCAN, 5 of you mucavorin. And this is the day we started the pump treatment. And here you can see this excellent response with the pump treatment. Now here again, all these black things are tumor. This is how she looked after CPT-11, 5 of you mucavorin. She failed the CPT-5 of you mucavorin. We started the pump treatment, and here's her scan. And she went on to a liver resection, but no tumor was found. And she went on to live 15 years after the scan. She died of a glioblastoma. So what about third line treatment? As you can see, that's really bad. These drugs were approved. They're very expensive drugs. They were approved because they gave about um, a six month increase. What actually was, excuse me, it was a one month. It was a one month, 1 1.4 and 1.9 month improvement in survival. That's how they were approved by the FDA. Now, here's what happens with a pump treatment, third line. This is the response rate. This is the survival, certainly better. And this is our curve from third line treatment. So these patients in this waterfall curve had all progressed on 5 of you, oxali and arena t -cam. And they're still showing responses or at least stable disease. So what about patients who are unresectable? What can we do? So this is what we call a prospective study. We had all the patients who were deemed unresectable at our institution, and that means they really had bad disease at our institution. <coughs> And then we gave them pump therapy systemic 
and bevacizumab. This particular study we'll show you in a minute. We no longer use bevacizumab because we increase the biliary toxicity for this. So we no longer use the bev, but you can see that there was really no difference in the response rate. You could get people to resection just with the pump and the systemic. And this is what we call um, a landmark survival analysis where we're only putting in the patients who got resected after one year. And this is their survival curve. They, we had one CR, we had five who never had a recurrence, three who had a recurrence, but we were able to salvage them. But still, this is a five year survival. So just to show you a, a patient that we were dealing with and what can happen. So here, clearly this patient, all these dark spots are metastatic disease and she was clearly unresectable. <clears throat> this is her PET scan, which again shows a very nice response, but you can't rely just on PET because this is her CAT scan. So you can see there's still disease remaining though much less than we started. So we did like a two-stage resection. We took out disease on one side. We did a portal vein embolization on the other side so we could come back and take the other side. And here she is 50 years later. Now, what's interesting about this lady is she had more than 25 lesions. She had a node positive primary, which isn't good. She had right-sided disease, which isn't good. She had seven lesions that were ablated, and not resected. She, she had KRAS mutation. All those things are bad, but she still was able to live 15 years and still, she's still alive, cancer free. So there are other institutions who have been publishing on this. Now, this is from Pittsburgh Group. What they did is they took um, 86 patients and they matched up the patients who received modern chemotherapy and HAI to modern chemotherapy alone. And this is the difference in their survival, 33 months versus 15 months. So it's a doubling of survival um, with the pump therapy. So what about liver resection? <clears throat> we know that about 30% of patients are alive in five years after liver resection, but 70% will reoccur either in the liver or extra pad. So we did a randomized study of liver resection and then randomized to pump and systemic versus systemic alone. And since it was a single institution study, we asked our statisticians, could we look at two years survival? Just to look at five years survival. You really need a lot of patients. So they told us we could do 156 patients. Um, to give us that endpoint. And we did enter 156 patients and 85% had the two year survival in the pump group, 69% in the systemic group. So if you look at that on a survival curve, this is what it looked like. This is the HAI group. Now, if you look at the recurrence in the liver, the yellow is the pump group you can see that there's a much higher recurrence in the liver if you don't get the pump. This is very significant. So what it's telling you is that the liver is being protected by the pump treatment. So you have much less recurrence. Now, if you look at the overall recurrence, it's also better, but of course not as great as it was in the liver. Now, this is a study done by my sister who compared surgery and chemo to surgery alone. She did this study with the ECOG group. And here's their hepatic recurrence free survival. So it looks almost identical to our group. And we now have four randomized studies. Uh, this is the European study who didn't use a pump. They used a port and didn't use FUDR. They did by the few. So their study was negative, but all the other studies were positive as far as hepatic disease-free and disease-free survival. So this is a curve from people at Memorial. So what we did is we looked at um, all the patients who had liver resection but were on protocol. They 
are on protocol, meaning they to enter the study, they shouldn't have had disease outside the liver. And if we look at those who were resected after 2003, we can see, here's the five-year survival, that 78% are alive five years. Now, this isn't um, actuarial survival. This is actual survival. So like 92 of the 118 are still alive at five years and a number of 10 years. So a study that came out again from Memorial sort of, I think, opened up the avenue for using pumps in many other centers. Because this study is a very large study, 2,368 patients. And what they did is look at the patients who got HAI and the ones who did not. And the ones who got HAI were worse patients. They had no positive tumors. They had more tumors, no positive in the primary. They had more tumors, they had a bad clinical risk score, and they had previous resection or RFA. So here's the uh, difference in survival in these two groups. It's almost a two-year increase in survival. Remember I told you the new drugs are approved with one month. There was one month increase in survival. This is two years. And you can see that even the patients with good characteristics like no, um, thank you. <laughs> no um, nodes in the primary or solitary meds. Even the good patients did well, but all of them did significantly better. So a lot of people ask about um, Y90 or spheres and liver transplants. So I just want to give you a little information on that. We don't have much information, but this is a study from the Pittsburgh group where they compared their patients with uh, HAI to the spheres or Y90. And you can see the survival difference is almost doubled again with the pump. This is, um, this is our work at Memorial um, and third line. So this is our survival for third line pump. And this is the survival at um, Robert Wood Johnson with the spheres. So to compare, again, what happens with spheres, all of their patients were in third line, but they were previously treated. And ours are third line, with quite a difference in survival. Now, this is a randomized study that came out about the spheres, where they compared systemic in Y90 to systemic low. And this is their progression-free survival. This is their overall survival, which wasn't different. And here's the response rate. So slightly different if they got the spheres in systemic versus systemic alone. However, if you compare that to our group, so these are unresectable. So our group, this is an unresectable group of liver mets treated at our institution published by the Angelica. The survival, like it was 30 months versus their 14. The response was 72% versus their 34%. Now, what about liver transplant? So the liver transplant people say that what the results they're getting are better than anything you could obtain with systemic chemotherapy. And that, that may be true, but they're not comparing it to pump therapy. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. And also, I want you to look at these studies. So the first study, first transplant study, they, they accrued 21 patients over five years, number one. And then this is their survival. So if you look at their five-year survival, if you look at the 21 patients, only one patient is out there five years, and yet they're reporting an excellent five-year survival. So this, this is the actual five-year survival. These are the, the curves around it. Now, here's the second CICA study. This one, they only had 50 patients. And again, look at who's out at five years. There's two patients out at five years. And again, they're reporting this excellent survival, but they're reporting this on very few patients. So I'm surprised they, they're saying they get such great results. So now let me show you what we get in our pump patients. Remember, for these transplant studies, they're looking at very good patients, patients with not a lot of tumor uh, and all sorts of criteria to get in the study. So 
Let's look at some of our patients. So these are our resectable patients. Now, if they don't have a RAS mutation, and they don't have a SMAD4 mutation, and they're resected, this is their survival. This is five years. This is 32. That when we ran the study, it was 32 of 109. 32. They're talking about one patient are alive here at like 80% are alive at five years. Now, these are the unresectable patients. Now, you would think all of them would be dead, but actually, some of them do very well. If they don't have a KRAS mutation, if they don't have a T53 mutation, and they don't have extra hepatic disease, here's their survival. No resection, just come. Here's five years. So here we're talking about 86, and we have 16 out that, that in some of the odds. So I think that's my last slide. Yeah, so now we have the questions. Yes, so now we have some questions. So we're gonna do a little bit of Q and A. Um, and so I'm gonna ask some questions here um, that were pre-submitted and things that folks were thinking about. And so hopefully everyone will get a lot out of this portion as well. So Dr. Kemeny, the first question is, in what clinical situations do you offer the pump? Well, the, there's three situations. One, where you do, you are able to perform a liver resection, and then we want to use the pump afterwards to prevent recurrences in the liver. Two, you have metastatic disease that's definitely not resectable, and you use the pump to try to shrink the disease. Now, in some patients, you don't shrink it enough to get to resection, but you do still increase their survival just by using the pump. But in some, you're able to shrink it enough so you can get to a section. Mm -hmm. And just a little bit of a follow-up to that, um, if you don't mind, if you could talk a little bit about the decision to get a pump at the time of a liver resection versus perhaps waiting to see what happens and then having a recurrence is it still possible to get the pump in that scenario? Uh, or would you recommend, you know, a patient really pursuing the pump at the time of resection and not waiting for recurrence? Yeah, I would definitely recommend doing it at the same time. Because once you close the patient and you try to reoperate, it's one, harder to get the pump in. And two, you're doing it then to prevent the recurrence. So if you're waiting for a recurrence, I mean, yes, you can do it then, but it, it's much better to do it and try to prevent recurrence. Yes. Because some of these patients, you know, after liver resection, they have less liver. Because remember, they've taken out part of the liver. So sometimes ablation and other things that you, you can do to the liver are, are sometimes harmful to the liver. So one of the questions was, do you offer the pump with the idea of curative intent? Yes. My hope is that, one, we never get a recurrence in the liver and they do well. Two, if they're unresectable, I get them to resection. So I always think I can cure them. Sometimes it doesn't happen, but I always think. And the next question is, what criteria make a patient a candidate to get the pump? And kind of as a follow-up to that, there was a specific question um, if a patient has small, stable lung mets, mm -hmm. is it still yeah. a potential option? So what makes it a good candidate for the pump? And then what if a person has stable lung mets? Is that still an option? Yeah, well, obviously the best candidate is a person with just liver disease. That's the best. But of the disease outside the liver, like lymph nodes or... Uh, the, the lung is, is better than most of the other mets because one, you can treat many of the lung mets with just ablation, especially if they have just one or two. And you could still go ahead and treat the liver. And a lot of people don't die from lung mets. They live much longer than from liver mets. So if you have one or two lung mets and you have a lot of liver mets, it's still worth doing the pump. But trying to take care of the one that's, in other words, trying to ablate them to something. Okay. 
So in your opinion, why has Sloan Kettering been so successful with the pump? And why has it taken so long for other hospitals to implement a pump program? It, it's not easy to implement a pump program. You have to have the surgeon. You have to have a medical oncologist who's willing to do it. You have to have an interventional uh, radiologist. So there's a whole team of people. So this can't just be done in any little hospital. But usually that needs to be done in you know larger cancer hospitals where they have all these facilities. Now, the, the people who were driving this pump, you know, as they went out to the community were the surgeons. The surgeons that trained at Memorial saw the results they were getting. So they wanted to give that to their community people. Mm -hmm. And so they went out and tried to do it. Now, they had to persuade the medical oncologists. Now, there is a financial part of this. You know, the pump. Is, is not that expensive. FUVR is not that expensive. Filling the pump doesn't give you a large income. So a lot of medical oncologists who, you know, are, are having problems living as they are with the, the economy the way it is, weren't keen on, on taking this on. Mm -hmm. So I think those were two problems. Um, the other problem was that I would get up at medical meetings, you know, when I presented that first uh, randomized study, the CALGB study, um, I presented my results and then the discussant at that meeting said, oh, well, only Nancy can do this, you know, which was <laughs> totally inappropriate at that meeting. But th there were things like that. It was like this kind of Thing that only we could do this when now we, we know that other people can do it. There's a lot of centers that have opened up, a lot of centers that have come for training. Both the medical and the surgical people have come for training, and they're doing very well because I, I hear from them, they're doing very well. So, we know that a lot of that work with the pump was done at Sloan Kettering by you. <laughs> yeah. um, how can all patients receive that level of care that Sloan Kettering has provided with the pump, uh, no matter where they're treated at one of these new, newer centers, for example, that are offering the pump? How do we know that they can receive that type of care? Well, again, <clears throat> if a person, if they have just opened up and you're going to be the first pump patient, I, I don't know, you know, but there are a lot of centers now that have done quite a few pumps. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I hear from them, they're doing quite well, you know, and they, I just went to a conference in Kentucky where they were showing some cases from colon and cholangio where they were getting great results. And they're also, what's interesting at, at Kentucky, what they were doing is they have a program to integrate all the other medical oncologists in Kentucky, you know, so not just the people I train, they're doing outreach programs to train the other centers so that people in the sticks of Kentucky can get this kind of treatment. Wow. So hopefully that's going to happen in other centers as well. It's amazing. That's uh, an amazing. It's amazing. Life. You may want to have them talking. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so once a patient decides to get the pump, what needs to be taken care of before the surgery in order to make sure the pump can be implanted? Not much. If they can undergo an operation for a colon resection, you do need to have your colon resected. It doesn't have to be resected before the pump goes in, but it has to be resected when the pump goes in. The reason we like to resect the, the primary disease is the systemic chemotherapy you're using as a lower dose. Uh, because of high doses of systemic with the pump you may get too much toxicity because FUDR is like 5-FU. So if you're giving FUDR into the liver and then you're giving your normal 5-FU systemic, you may be too much. So you have to lower your doses. So you have to take out the primary, as I said, either before or at the time of the pump placement. And you can take it out at the same time as the pump placement. That's not a problem. So you have to have that. You you have to, you know, be worked up. I mean, you can't be morbidly sick, you know, with uh, heart disease and everything else. You have to be able to undergo an operation. Right. But, you know, um, 
<laughs> that's that's about it. You have to make sure you don't have massive disease outside of you. So, so obviously you need a CAT scan. You don't mm-hmm. have to have a PET scan. We don't always do PET scans. I'll tell you why. PET scans sometimes light up things that are not that, and then you get confused. So if we have a good CAT scan and it doesn't show disease outside the liver, you're a cat. That's good. Good to understand the difference. Uh, so if a patient goes through with the pump, they get the procedure, what can they expect uh, from an average type recovery? And then also what daily life activities may need to be modified after getting a pump? Yeah. All right. So the first thing is, um, I'll answer the second question first. So when you have a pump in, they remember that catheter goes up and it's tied into a uh, hepatic artery, you know, the gastrodulinal artery, it's tied in. So I am not in love with jog, you know, on a hard surface. <clears throat> because I actually saw one young woman where the catheter came out. <clears throat> So they can jog on a treadmill if they want. They can uh, bike if they want. They can swim if they want. Swimming doesn't affect it. They cannot go scuba diving because this is a uh, works by pressure. So the main things that they can't do are significant jogging and scuba diving. Otherwise, they can do their exercises. They can bike and do that kind of thing. Uh, what else would you say? Uh, so that that's how it affects it. You know, I didn't show you the slides. Um, on the CLGB study, they looked at quality of life on the people who got the pump and didn't get the pump. And the quality of life was better in the pump patients because they were feeling better. Even though they had an operation, the systemic group did not have an operation. Even though there was operation in the pump group, they were feeling better and their quality of life was better. So I don't think it affects the quality of life except for those two things I told you. And what was the first part of that question? It was, oh. what, can, what can patients expect during the procedure and the, the kind no, no, of no. average recovery? Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. So again, it depends on how much surgery you're doing. If you're just putting a pump in, it's a very quick recovery. Matter of fact, with these laparoscopic pumps that they're putting in, the person's out of the hospital in three days. If they are getting a liver resection, depends how much of a liver resection they're getting, that will limit how long you're in the hospital and how you'll feel afterwards. It's not really the pump procedure that's changing, you know, your time in the hospital. It's the um, what they're doing to you. You know, you're doing the colon resection, the liver resection. That kind of thing. Does that so answer that? It does. <laughs> uh, do patients still get systemic chemo at the same time? That's as an important question. Yeah, people say, even my patients say, oh, well, you know, I progressed on systemic. I don't need systemic. Well, if you do FEDR alone, you're getting one drug, one drug. If you do FEDR with systemic, you're getting more drugs, okay? And we've shown in all the systemic literature that you do better when you have a combination of drugs. So I don't like giving FEDR alone. I don't think you get the same results, number one. Number two, if you do FEDR alone, you're not treating the rest of the body. So you have more chance of getting lung meds and the other meds that come up. So you, you need the systemic for that. So the first studies that were done with the pump, and they used just pump alone, showed the this recurrence, the extrahepatic recurrence, which, by the way, occurs in transplant, too. They don't tell you that. They get the same kind of recurrence that we get with the pump, with lung being the most, the most usual place for recurrence. Does getting the hepatic pump therapy reduce the amount of systemic chemo that needs to be used? Yes. Yes, you get a reduction, so the toxicity should be less. Sometimes because you're getting both treatments, some people do experience better progress. Just like just they like- Oh, sorry. Can <laughs> thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. 
I've done it myself. So, um, so you, you know, you have the touches you get if you're receiving systemic with the pump, like you should be. You will still get some systemic toxicity, depending on the patient. Some people don't get it at all, but some people do get diarrhea, blood count depression. And remember, as far as the pump's concerned, the major toxicity is that we could hurt the liver, the bile ducts. So we're checking very carefully the liver function test every two weeks. And if you are going somewhere that's not memorial and you're doing a program with them, you can ask them, you know, what are my liver function tests? You know, and what's happening? To, I, I have patients ask me, even though I'm supposedly an expert, they'll ask, they'll look at their bloods and say, well, what about this outpost? What about this billing? You know, they'll ask me, just fine. Okay. Someone asked if the dosage on the systemic would be decreased immediately as soon as the yes. therapy started. Okay. Yes. Yes. And this was a good question, actually, that I don't see, but I think it's important and it kind of belongs here. And that's, is there a side, are there side effects with the hepatic pump therapy like there are with the systemic? The side effects, the systemic side effects you're getting are from the systemic drug. The liver side effects you're getting are from the pump, you know, the elevation in bilirubin or liver function test. So that's from the pump. Though you can get elevation liver function tests like from Oxali and uh, Arena TCAN. So those systemic drugs can also do this, but it's more common to have it after a pump treatment than with systemic. Okay. Uh, what will the overall side effects or toxicity of the treatment? <clears throat> Well, the old, we just discussed that the overall would be that the bad toxicity would be that you elevate what's called a bilirubin. Mm -hmm. And then we stop the pump treatment. We put Decadron in the pump. We actually hold a systemic right then too. And hopefully the bilirubin comes down. In the cases where it doesn't come down, they would require a stent. So that's the toxicity I, I don't want. It's, it should be a rare toxicity. Mm -hmm. How often will a patient need to return to the doctor's office? And yeah. what is yeah. the pump refilled with each time during active treatment? Yeah, so during active treatment, one, so the way we handle our patients, so to make maybe explain this is the pump drug goes in once a month with the FUDR. Two weeks later, you get saline. So with many of my patients, they got the saline where they live you know, by their local doctor and got the systemic there and then returned to me once a month for the pump treatment. Now, like in Kentucky, what they're trying to do is teach the local doctors, you know, what to do and how to give the drugs so that they don't have to return once a month. They're trying that, but, but, you know, they're trying a protocol to try. It. But, but you have to some doctor definitely has to see you once a month to look at all the liver function tests and decide what dose of FUDR is going in. The systemic dose is easier for a lot of doctors because they know that if you're getting a lot of diarrhea, you lower the dose, or if you're getting a lot of blood count depression, you lower the dose. But the pump therapy is sort of special. You really have to carefully look at the liver function test. Okay. Um, how long does active treatment with the pump therapy tend to last? And are there a maximum number of treatments? There aren't a maximum number of treatments. It depends on your liver function test. So if they're, if they're getting a high dose, usually you don't get a high dose in for, you know, many cycles. But for instance, the cholangio patients who we sometimes don't get to resection, so they're continuing on their treatment, they can sometimes get these low doses for years. So there's no maximum treatment. It's your liver function that tell you that. Okay. And then you said, how long does active treatment? Well, the treatment um, you're doing, you, you, you're, if you don't have resectable disease, they should be looking at your scan every two months to see if you become resectable. And if you have resectable disease, you're getting six months of treatment afterwards as what we call adjuvant, six months. So there's an ending to the adjuvant. For the metastatic, which means it's not resectable, 
you you put in, you know, you keep going with your treatment until you get to resection. Okay. So the next question is for some of the folks with the longer term. So, um, you know, we've talked, you talked a lot about those longer term patients. So if a patient gets a recurrence in the liver after being finished with active treatment or might have deposits or artifacts in the abdomen, um, would the pump still be able to be used if the pump had already been placed? Yeah, that's a good question. So if, well, two things can happen. You, 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 let's say you're an adjuvant patient and you finished your adjuvant treatment. And six months later, you have a recurrence. So it depends where you have the recurrence. If you have the recurrence in the liver, you would you, you can use the pump again if the liver functions are okay. If you have a recurrence in the lung, you can use systemic and you don't have to go back to your pump treatment because your liver is okay. But if, if you have recurrence in lung and liver, you can do both. Great. And when um, active treatment with the pump therapy is finished, does the pump stay in? Well, most of my patients want the pump to stay in because once you remove a pump, it does not go back in. It cannot go back in. That You lose that artery clutch. So most recurrences come within two years. So I definitely would not remove a pump before two years. But since some occur a little bit later, it's not a bad idea keeping, you know, the adjuvant pumps in, you know, till maybe four years to make sure there's no recurrence before you take it out. Okay. So what is the pump refilled with when active treatment is finished? It can be re refilled with a compound called glycerol, which lasts for eight weeks. So you don't have to come every two weeks to the doctor's office. Because if you're filling it with saline and heparin, it has to be filled every two weeks. Okay. So if we have patients, um, kind of this goes to removal, but she says she is a pump patient and approaching three years of surveillance only. Uh, the last pump treatment was in January of 21 and drives you know, an hour every eight weeks to get the pump uh, serviced. How does how do the medical teams make the decision on timing and removal of the pump when no evidence of disease and well, three years of net? They don't make that decision. I mean, it's, it's sort of the, them and the patient. If the patient says, look, I don't want to do this drive. It's three years. I don't have a recurrence. You can remove it. You made it to three years, which is very good. And you may never see a recurrence. But you're taking a small chance that if there is a recurrence, you can't use the pump again. So you have to decide as a patient whether you want to do that and how much of a you know problem it is for you to make that drive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> are, there, are there other considerations or other situations for having the pump removed, such as complications maybe? Oh yeah, well, if you get what's called a pump infection, unfortunately they're extremely rare, but if you have an infection, if, if it occurs right at the time of surgery, there's two things that can happen. One, they just remove it and move the whole area to a higher spot and put in a new pump, or they clean out the area as best they can and give you antibiotics. So the things you have to do with an infection. Now, it, it's again, it's a very rare to have an infection because when these pumps are filled by you know very specialized nurses who know what they're doing, the areas you know, cleaned off and kept very sterile. And therefore you shouldn't have a pump infection, but sometimes you have a pump infection from the surgery. You know, somehow the whole area got contaminated because you had a bowel surgery, somehow it got contaminated. Then you have to deal with that right away. So uh, that's my list of questions. And I know we're not taking live questions. There are a couple here that I think you'd be okay to answer. Uh, one of them is, are there any contraindications for the pump if a patient doesn't have disease outside the liver? Which I think, you know, is a good question. I don't think uh, there's a contraindication. If, if you're talking about, for instance, of somebody who has hepatitis, you know, is that a contraindication? You, many, they have many treatments for hepatitis now. 
Um, and if they stay on their hepatitis treatment, you can get a pump. You cannot get off your hepatitis treatment because <laughs> you can have problems. We had one case like that, another severe problem. So if you stay on your hepatitis medicine, you still can get a pump. Um, and if you're not comfortable answering this one, I'm okay with that. But someone asked, you know, for those cancer centers that are out there, such as MD Anderson, that still don't offer the pump, do you have thoughts on that? Well, recently, people from MD Anderson told me that they were going to do a pump trial. Uh, they have been very rigid about starting a pump trial for some reason. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, I get patients from them, which is incredible. <laughs> Because <laughs> the, the patient says they want to pump, and they say, "Well, go to New York." You know, so they they actually say that. But now they'll be able to say they can go to other centers um, that are closer to them. Okay. Um, and then again, if you're not comfortable answering, that's okay because I know we weren't taking any really live questions. But I'm trying to just um, ask mm -hmm. a little bit: Is there any documentation or evidence that? you know, there could be other regimens used with the pump other than FUDR? Well, in, in Europe, as I said, they don't have a pump, but they have a catheter going to the liver and they use oxaliplatin. They get some extraction. If you don't get extraction of the drug, there's not an advantage to use it. So for instance, with the rena TCAN, another one of our good oncology drugs, there is no advantage. So it's a no point in doing it. But oxaliplatin, there's a slight extraction so there, there's a little advantage so in europe they're showing advantage of doing interhepatic you know like we do with the pump but they do it with the catheter into the liver so there is and we have done some studies on minimycin which also has some extraction of it in the liver now we haven't tested you know new drugs like the egf or receptors and those kind of things because we needed a number of centers, we need, you know, originally it was just me. Now there's a number of centers doing this. So we may be able to test new drugs and see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for that. Um, someone's asking, you know, with your retiring and, you know, are there other, you know, oncologists at Sloan Kettering that are comfortable with the pump? Yeah, all the oncologists. All of them have been trained, many of them by me, and they're very comfortable with the pump. So there's no problem coming to Memorial. And of course, we still have great surgeons. So that, that, those are two things going on. And I think there's only a couple more. Someone asked about using the EGFR, but I think um, you said, of course, that you can use that with the pump. You, you can. We have a study on that. You cannot use bevacizumab. Right, so no Avastin. can use EGFR drugs, yes. And one patient did say that um, does a TP53 mutation make the pump, you know, and something that could not be... Um, no, treated. it doesn't make it. It's just that like KRAS mutation and other mutations, some patients do worse with if you have mutations. But that doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that they may not do as well as a person who doesn't have those mutations. Okay. I think this is most everything except there, someone was asking about a catheter related infection risk. Is that something that's a major well, issue? The catheter, the way a catheter can get infected is if you have like a urinary tract infection and it's not treated, and somehow you infect the whole body, you can infect the catheter. So when you're on a pump, you shouldn't get infections that are not treated. They should be treated. <coughs> now, I just want to say that there are a lot of centers out there. So you, you should, you know, try to find the center that's closest to you and, and, you know, go to them and talk to them about what they're doing and what's going on. So you don't have to come just to Memorial. And so I think that's, that's an important message. So thank you for that. You know, I think yeah. with all the centers opening up, it does make it a lot more accessible. And I think right. that's a 
of course, is part of your legacy and a part of your work because you trained, I think you trained all of them. <laughs> so um, there was a comment about, do you become ineligible for clinical trials or other studies if you've had the pump? You shouldn't. I mean, it depends on the study. I, I do want to say something about the spheres, you know, the microspheres. I really think that patients that are thinking about that to do the pump first because I really think once you've done the microspheres I don't think the the pump results are as, as good so you can always do the microspheres after the pump there's no problem we've done that a lot in our institution so and, and we do what we do is we use like localized microspheres which are much give you a much higher response than treating the whole liver so let's say we did the pump, we're doing very well, but one area is growing. You could do a localized sphere there. But I would suggest not doing the spheres before the pump. Thank you for that. Um, I guess just a question that, that I have, um, are there any words of wisdom that you'd like to share with this, uh, this kind of subset of patients, these liver mets patients upon your retirement? Um, any food for thought or lessons learned about living well or um, anything you'd like to share? I think that um, the other thing you have to do as a patient is that, let's say you're doing very well from the liver and suddenly you develop a lung mat, consider treating everything aggressively. So the lung mats can be ablated, um, things can be removed, you know, just don't continue with just chemotherapy and chemotherapy, but things can be removed and ablated and dealt with to make your life longer and more comfortable. Great. And is that a conversation you feel like the patient should have with their oncologist and yes. bring it up if, if yes. the oncologist is not? Okay. Yes. Yes. So I, I have a patient in the South, you know, started the pump treatment there. And they're doing very well, liver very well. And then she developed lung mets. And so then the surgeon there had to send her to me because the people down there weren't really going to treat the lung that's aggressive, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an important message. It's definitely something we try in Colon Town, you know, get the second opinion, the third opinion and, you know, advocate for yourself and ask the questions and, you know, don't be afraid. Um, <laughs> So I, it's great to hear that from you, that the patients are not being seen as, you know, problematic <laughs> if they're trying to advocate for themselves. Yeah. Um, and we did have a comment just to say thank you so much for persisting in the face of bias from your own colleagues um, and paving this path that patients truly appreciate. So there's so much appreciation and admiration and respect for you and our community. I know that I speak for all of us when I say that. So we are just so thankful for this talk. I know that many people will watch the recording, um, you know, in the future. So you're going to help a lot of patients just from, just from this. Um, so I hope I didn't miss anything. Um, but the comments are coming in just saying how grateful we are for her. What a rock star you are, all of those things. And I know that that's all true. So I hope I didn't miss anything that was too. Um, I tried to ask everything that we had you know, done in advance. So hopefully I, I did get to all of that. Well, thank, thank you again for doing all the work you've done. And thank you to all my patients. <laughs> I know you've got quite a few of them in here tonight yeah. that are here to support you. So there's no doubt about that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we really appreciate you once again, and um, we'll be in touch. Thanks for everyone attending also. We appreciate all of you for being here, for Dr. Kemeny and, and to, uh, to hear all about the pump. <laughs>